What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Crypto Current. Your host here, Richard Carthon. And today I got a very special one for you. We are going to be looking at Forda Network, but likes to go by Forda. But we have a really amazing person to kind of break all the amazing things that they have going down. Uh, we have Andy, who's an ecosystem lead over at Forda. How are you doing today? Great, Richard. Thanks for having me. No problem, man. Well, excited to learn more about Forda and the real-time security operational monitoring that it has to offer. But before we do that, I want to learn a little bit more about you. Can you give us a little background about yourself? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll go as far back, I guess, as my introduction into, into the space. Um, so as we were talking about in the pre-interview, started my career as a corporate lawyer. I graduated law school in uh, 2012. And um, within a year sort of stumbled on crypto. I had a buddy that I met at a hackathon that ended up starting an exchange and um, uh, started doing, you know, corporate and regulatory work, state and federal regulatory work for um, some of the early crypto exchanges. Um, this particular one was called CoinMKT, but I ended up working with an exchange called Poloniex, which was really small back then and then got really big. Um, and then worked with, you know, some, uh, some more... Uh, sort of retail-focused products like Blockfolio. That was also based in LA at the time. Um, and did that for three and a half years. That was kind of my introduction into the space uh, through that angle. And then I transitioned to consulting and I worked at EY uh, on their crypto and blockchain team for five years uh, from 2016 to 2021. And we worked primarily with like the top of the market. So whereas when I was an attorney, I was working with you know smaller startups um, who were, you know, raising money and building teams and sort of typical kind of venture path. Um, at EY, we were working with, you know, banks, fintechs, uh, large like private crypto companies, um, you know, Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken, Finance, et cetera, um, helping them either, helping them like become more sophisticated financial institutions. And then on the, on like the, the bank and fintech side, we were helping them integrate crypto products and services into their, you know, into their businesses. Um, so, and then I left in uh, early 2021 and joined uh, Open Zeppelin. And at the time we were spinning what is now Florida out of Open Zeppelin. So last, <clears throat> last summer we went through a, a, a round of funding for Florida, officially spun the network out like right after that. Um, and uh, since October 1st, Forda, the Forda network has been live. Um, and uh, I work for the Forda Foundation. Me and my colleagues work for the Forda Foundation now. So we're the, we're the entity sort of behind the scenes that is kind of the steward of the, the network for the time being. Man, what an interesting journey. So you, you've been in the space for a tremendous amount of time working with startups, uh, working with the, uh, the bigger players in, in the game and uh, uh, go on to create Forda and, and be one of the people like leading in, in, in creating this. So first, I just want to go back. What drew you to the world of cryptocurrency? Like, What was that first introduction and, and why did you decide this is the path that I want to go? I was having this conversation with someone last night, a buddy at, at dinner. Um, um, so I'm very, you know, I'll be very transparent. Like I don't have an ideological sort of draw to the space that that a lot of people do. Um, for me, uh, at the time, it it was a I saw it as an opportunity. Um, this was a it was a brand new sort of space when I started in 2013. Right, very very small, very very new very misunderstood and i just you know i think it you know so cliche but like i it was just a um it was something that like a a 26 year old you know lawyer could, i could kind of fit in in that space right yeah um i didn't need to have a lot of prior experience everyone was learning on the fly right um and i thought you know that was that was neat because if had had i spent time in any other sort of aspect of tech Lawyers with 20 years of experience were way better than me at their job, right? Than I was because I was fresh out of I was fresh out of law school, right? But crypto was sort of this great equalizer in that, like, no one knew anything about it back then, especially in, especially in the legal world. Um, and so I felt I felt as knowledgeable as anybody else uh, about it, even though I was just scratching the surface then. So 
Um, so that was really it for me. It created an opportunity um, for a young for a young lawyer to sort of you know um, kind of carve out a niche. Um, yeah. And then as I've gotten as I've sort of you know progressed, um, the people are really what keep me engaged now. Um, so much of my professional and social circles are the same now. Um, and so I can't, I can't leave even if I wanted to, because I would, <laughs> I would alienate all my, I would alienate all my friends. Um, and I think like a, a more, like a deeper point there is, um, the people that are in this space too. So many of them are so, um, intellectually curious and smart and, um, you know, it's great to be surrounded by people like that. Cause you're constantly learning, constantly being challenged. Um, and I think for anyone who's listening, who's like not in the space that maybe thinking about getting into crypto, like, you know, you've seen me change careers in this industry three times, right? I started as a lawyer, then I became a consultant. Now I'm, you know, now I'm doing essentially business development and strategy work for a for a cybersecurity project. Um, so, you know, I'm, you can kind of reinvent yourself, but uh, but also like there are there are just so many opportunities. Uh, you know, if you're willing to spend the time to learn and and put in the work, you know, to 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 meet to meet people. Um, the space grows and evolves so fast. Like there's so many new corners of it emerging all the time. And, um, uh, you know, yeah, if you're, if you're hungry, you can, you can, um, you can get in there and, and really make an impact quickly. So, uh, Definitely. I think the great space for that. Yeah. For people who are looking for opportunities, I, I can't think of a better industry to work in. I agree, man. And, the opportunities continue to present themselves. And just like you said, you've you've had three career changes, even within this space. And a lot of people think that when you work in the world of crypto, everything is, uh, they don't realize just how many different facets of business that you can still participate in and kind of carve in your own niche and, and knowledge base. And that we're still very early to this space. that You can still come in and become a, an expert in a, in a short amount of time than you have in some of the traditional markets. But definitely appre- appreciate you sharing that sentiment. Um, but I'm fast forwarding up to, you know, last October, you officially launched Forda. And you have been in this space long enough to see a lot of the various challenges that are within the world of Web3. And security happens to be one of those large challenges. Um, you see a lot of scams. You see a lot of people losing money. All of these different things. Talk to us about one why you created Forda and and how has Forda been able to um, help a lot of the different organizations and companies that you're working with. I mean, one of the things on on the website right now is that you have 36 billion in total value locked monitored by Forda's decentralized network, which is a lot, which is tremendous. Kind of talk to us about that journey of how you got it there. Yeah, sure. So. Uh... I'm assuming, you know, I, I wasn't a security expert when I joined Forda and um, I assume most of the people listening are not as well. So really simple. I'm going to lay out a really simple framework to kind of how to, how to think about the smart contract, how to think about like the Web3 security stack, I'll call it, um, and where we fit in that. So you can have a, you know, a framework or point of reference uh, as we talk more. So um Forda monitors on-chain activity. So we monitor smart contract activity. Uh, there's an off-chain component as well, um, which is more like the Web2 aspect of security. But every Web3 project has a has a Web2 component too, right? And so you, you right. can't ignore that. And we can talk about that a little bit too. Um, but in terms of sort of on-chain monitoring, smart contract security, I, I lump everything into two buckets. You have pre-deployment, and post-deployment. So pre-deployment is like things you do from a security standpoint before your contracts are deployed on mainnet, right? Use Ethereum as an example. Um, And then there are things you do from a security standpoint after you deploy your contracts. So pre-deployment is dominated by using templates. OpenZeppelin has the biggest smart contracts library the vast majority of DeFi projects, at least building on, you know, building with Solidity, use Open Zeppelin contracts, right? Um, very few people, very few devs now are like building contracts from scratch, unless it's something truly novel, right? Like if you're building an AMM, you're building a, you know, you're, you know, uh, 
uh, you're introducing like a governance module into your system uh, or, you know, multi-sigs or whatever it is, right? Like these are all template contracts now, right? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, so using templates is one way to improve security, right? Uh, the second thing you do free deployment is you get one or more audits. Um, and that's looking at the code, right? That's a point in time assessment of your code. Fast forward to, okay, now those contracts are live. What are you doing? Best practice is to have a bug bounty program in place, right? You're, you're essentially incentivizing white hat hackers to find vulnerabilities in your, in, your, in your system and point those out to you before something bad happens. Um, so bug bounty program, there's great platforms out there like Immunify that you know, host these bug bounty uh, programs for teams. Um, and then the other two pillars of post-deployment security are real-time monitoring and alerting, and then incident response. So I'll break these two things down real quick. So real-time monitoring and alerting or runtime run -time monitoring is watching your system in real-time as it's working. Okay? So, you know, a... Uh, a decent analogy here is like, you know, the instrumentation panel on a plane or a race car, right? Like, you know, you, you know, your what are my fuel levels? What's the wind speed? You know, what's my altitude? All these things so that the pilot, whoever's, you know, responsible for this thing knows what's going on with all the different component parts, right? In real time. Right. So you have the same thing for software systems, right? Uh, and you want to watch all these components in real time. Uh, you're watching for two things. One, you want to make sure that like things are working like they're supposed to, and then you're also looking for threats and malicious activity, right? Uh, which in DeFi is very important uh, because these software systems are, you know, oftentimes controlling billions of dollars, as you pointed out, right? There's you know tens of billions of dollars of TVL uh, that these contracts are responsible for. Um, so you need to you need to you need to have you know security cameras basically like pointed. At those contracts, watching everything that happens, um, and then the second piece. I know this is a long intro, but hopefully it's a helpful framework. The second uh, thing there, and it's very closely related to real-time monitoring and alerting, is something called incident response, which is, let's say you're watching an aspect of a protocol and you get an alert that's like blinking red. Okay, what do you do with that? Right? Is it? Can you dismiss it quickly? Is it a false positive? Or is that red alert saying, hey, your system's getting hacked right now. Funds are being drained. Like you need to do something right away. And the incident that would kick off some emergency response plan, right? Maybe you're maybe you need to pause a protocol. Maybe you need to try and front run a transaction, whatever it is, right? Um, there's a whole host of things you can do, but you can't do anything if you're not watching, right? Right. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of teams today don't have good monitoring in place. So they they don't know when something bad is happening, uh, and because they don't know when something something bad is happening, they can't react quickly to it. Right? They're sitting sitting ducks effectively. Um, right. So anyway, that's the framework. Where does Forta sit in? Forta lives in this real time monitoring and alerting layer. Right? Um, we're we're a um, we're a network, so you can think about it like this. Um, we're like this layer that sits above DeFi. So. If you're thinking about like the the web, you know, the tech stack, right? You have like Ethereum on the bottom, mm -hmm. and then you have the protocols at the next layer, right? Uniswap, Compound, Aave, et cetera, right? And then above that is Forda. And Forda is like this layer that is looking down onto DeFi, right? And um, the way the network works is developers, you can be an individual developer, you can be a core developer on a protocol team. You can install the equivalent of like security cameras on the Forda network, and it's we call them bots, but it's it's just a piece of code, piece of uh, like a script that you can publish onto the network, um, and uh, each bot is tasked with watching something specific. Maybe it's watching for uh, you know large movements of a particular token. Maybe it's watching for withdrawals or deposits inside of a multi-sig. Maybe it's monitoring for like ownership changes of a contract. Maybe it's monitoring for tornado cash activity because that's usually associated with exploits. Maybe it's watching for phishing-related attacks, right? It's looking for like mass token approvals 
from a specific address, right? Where people are going to like a fake website and like giving it unknowingly giving it approval to, you know, access that the assets in their wallet, right? Which happens all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our job as the Forda network is to be as flexible as possible and support all these use cases. Developers, both independently and on teams, but can use this network to basically deploy, you know, virtual cameras and point them at whatever they want to watch. Um, and then what happens is when those cameras find something that they're looking for, the network emits alerts about that. So like every block, there's, you know, like a big uh, alert emission that happens, right? And, you know, thousands of alerts are broadcast publicly. Um, and what those alerts are signaling is sort of based on the the bots that are running on the network, right? Um, and so you mentioned, you know, there are, there's 30, whatever, 30, you know, 30 plus billion monitored TVL being monitored by Forda right now. What that means is that um, there are, there are bots on the network that are, that are watching those protocols who have that, who have control over those assets, right? Um, and, um, you know, Forda is sort of like this alarm system, security camera and alarm system that's sort of, you know, trying to identify threats, malicious activity, other like operational issues um, in real time. And then hopefully, uh, you know, those alerts are being received by those teams, right? So if you're, you know, someone at Maker and you get an alert that something's not working right, or you get an alert that, you know, liquidity or, you know, uh, collateral is being drained from some vault, right? Um, then hopefully you can respond, you know, quickly enough to either prevent that from happening or to mitigate the damage uh, caused by it. So that's the idea. It's yeah. A big giant and, security camera alarm system for DeFi. Which is really cool. And, and just so I can recap a lot of that. So there's there's basically two ways you look at security. One is real time, seeing what's going on and, and, and making sure you're aware of what's going on. Then once something is happening, it's responding. How do you then take care of once you are now being notified and alerted that something is happening um, to have some sort of response in place to go and address it. So what Forda is doing is kind of a, a layer three, if you will, above your layer one, like an Ethereum, then you have a protocol, then uh, Forda is above that, looking at everything that's happening below, making sure, that, uh, first, just giving you a real-time view of what's happening. And then if something happens, it, then it's allowing alerts for these developers who are then uh, building these these bots to to monitor certain things. So if I'm a um, dev on maker and i have a certain DeFi protocol that i want to watch and then all of a sudden uh like you said collateral is being drained from it i get alerted and now i can immediately go and address this uh because i have an alert in place to make sure that i can go and address it as soon as it happens that's right yeah and this you know this problem for those listening this probably sounds like very intuitive right like of course you of course you watch what's going on in real time right um but in reality uh it's, you know, a lot of teams don't have good monitoring. They don't have comprehensive monitoring in place. Maybe they're watching, you know, for TVL or they're watching for, you know, large token movements, but they're not watching for that specific sort of once in a blue moon, you know, invariant that like no one really expects, but when it happens, it's a really big deal, right? right. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why um, there isn't, really good comprehensive like in-depth monitoring across the board um one is that uh most DeFi teams are small by nature right uh they're in you know they're meant to be like decentralized projects right and so they're, they're you know they don't they're never gonna have most of them are never gonna have like in-house full-time security teams like you would at a traditional company right right well, when you don't have that function, uh, you know, uh, you end up, you know, what, what you do have are like core product people. And, you know, you have smart contract engineers, right, who are, who are maintaining the protocol, but who may not be security experts. Um, and so, um, you know, they're doing, they're doing some operational monitoring, but they're not doing a lot of really complicated, you know, uh, thorough sort of threat detection, right? Um, right. So, 
we lack a lot of like security specialty on teams today because they're small. Uh, the second thing is um, it's also hard to do, and there aren't great tools for it today. Um, you know, there are there are a few tools where you can do some really basic monitoring, but in terms of like doing like really advanced like threat detection type stuff, there's nothing that's widely available to uh, protocol teams today, right? There are a couple auditors out there who have in-house things that they've built that are proprietary that they'll sell as part of a service. But there's nothing that a team can just sort of like take off the shelf and like deploy for them, you know, deploy really, really easily. So because there aren't great tools, um, no one does it. Um, Because you need to build it in-house and test it and you need a full-time team to maintain it. Like it's, you know, it's just, uh, it's a lot of, lot of effort. So, um, we didn't we didn't realize this at the beginning you know it took us 6 months 8 months of talking with teams to realize like oh, okay no one's really doing you know security monitoring right now um right. and so uh forda is really filling that gap in the market uh today and so we're seeing more and more teams like deploy bots that are specifically monitoring for threats right right um Let's let's stay there because um I think yep. what's really cool about this right now is that you, you brought up a really good point. There's a lot of uh, teams that are building right now. It's bearish time, so there's a lot of people building. They're staying lean. They're not really growing teams, and unfortunately, a lot of the time they're so focused on building out the product and getting out to market everything else that uh, not that security isn't a focus, but it might not be as thorough as it could be um, while it's still in its nascent and growing. So for someone who's listening to this, they're like, yep, I have this on my roadmap. I know this is something I need to get to and I want to like get to it as my TVL in, in our protocol grows. Um, what can they do to start utilizing Forda? Yeah, great question. So uh, there are a couple of ways to onboard to uh, the network. Um, the, the easiest way to, to do it is to just subs- you can subscribe to bots that are already running on the network. Um, so for example, like if, you, if, you're a, if you're a user of, I'll use Lido as, as an example, because Lido has a lot of really good monitoring running on Forda today. You can find all the Lido bots that are that are currently running on Forda. It's like it's like having a public security camera feed that like anyone can tap into. It'd be like a it's like having a security camera feed for like your local bank, like as a TV channel on your you know at home that you can just like you can flip to and be like, okay, I can watch the security camera. There's this that that same concept applies here, right? There's a lot of it's all this is all public monitoring, so anyone who wants to watch it can watch it. Um, so uh, that's one easy way is just go subscribe to an existing bot if you know if it's monitoring something that you care about. Um, if you're a developer working for a protocol team, uh, there's the sort of low friction way of onboarding, and then there's the uh, sort of high friction way of onboarding, and both are really valuable. So low friction, uh, we have something called like a like a, a bot wizard, which is basically like a no code way to de- to build and deploy really really simple bots. So you can get basic monitoring for like function calls, events, balances, thresh, you know, uh, Oracle threshold, things like that. Um, and you can get some really simple bots up and running for your protocol without doing any custom coding. It'll take you literally, you know, probably take you five or ten minutes to do this. Um, then uh, once you get that in place. And you're more familiar with Forda, and you're ready to start doing some more sophisticated things. Um, then you can actually like develop your own bots uh, from scratch. You you can leverage some of our templates, but you know you can actually start to sort of code your own. And um, uh, most of the DeFi teams that are using Forda today, whether it's Maker or Lido or um, Balancer, DYDX, Instadapt, whoever, um, have built their own custom bots, right? There are devs on the team that have used our SDK and they know what they want to watch for, right? So they've either figured that out or they've worked with their auditor and collectively they've, they've, they've identified all the risks they need to pay attention to. And then based on those risks, they're creating monitoring to watch those things. Uh, That's kind of the flow that I would recommend any team, you know, go through, figure out what you need to watch first and then build monitoring to watch it. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. Those, those, yeah, those are great first steps. Um, and as a reminder for everyone listening, if you go to forda.org, you can get more information on that and uh, find some more 
great things that you can be doing to improving your security and, and things that you want to be monitoring. But, you know, Andy, since we have such a great security expert, I do want to ask just one final security question around where do you see security evolving in Web3 from where and when you first started to where it is now and where it's headed? Like, how do you see security continue to evolve into the future? Yeah, I'll make, uh, I'll make two predictions. Um, n- none of these are actually like sort of my original ideas. We've got a great head of research at the Florida Foundation, Christian Seifert. And so I'm going to borrow, I'm going to borrow some of his perspective here. Um, so I think he's right. Um, so one of them is that um, because we have so much public data available, right? Uh, all the transaction data is publicly available on chain, right? Um, so like Web3 has this really unique kind of dynamic where you have data availability is like 100, right? It's, it's everywhere. Anyone can get it. We all have access to the same thing. But the structure of that data and like extracting the signal out of all that noise is, is the hard part, right? Um, whereas like in Web2, you have really structured data, but it's also like, it's all like all, most of it's very private, right? Because you have a bunch of centralized, you know, sort of tech companies and infrastructure companies that, you know, are very siloed and kind of how they maintain that, right? So yeah. that's the difference in dynamic between like Web2 and Web3 data, right? So Web3, everything's open. Everyone can, everyone can look at the same data set, right? We all have access to the same thing. So that means data scientists and machine learning engineers like have everything they need at their disposal to analyze, detect patterns, predict behavior, right? And get really, really sophisticated in terms of what you can, what you can sort of watch and discern from you know, uh, on-chain transactions and, and user behavior because it's all public, right? So... All that leading up to my first prediction, you're going to see a lot of data scientists and machine learning engineers like moving into the space and sort of like starting to dominate the security conversation, I think, right? Because um, that's, their, that's their field, right? Uh, the second thing is that um, security is going to get uh, uh, the response process, like how you respond to it. Like right now, if a team gets notified about a hack, they cannot respond fast enough to prevent it because teams have like a multi-sig in place that is like the, uh, that has the authority to like pause a protocol, right? So you have to get the multi-sig has to approve something. Well, what's a multi-sig? It's it's a bunch of people, right? Who all need to get brought up to speed on what's going on. And then they all need to sign a transaction, right? And that takes time. That takes way too long to respond, right? So by the time you've done all that, hacks happen, money's gone. Um, and so moving from a manual, moving from manual, like threat response to automated, where like the second an alert fires, something triggers in the system, right? It's either a circuit breaker that slows the system down, just like a stock market, right? When the stock market crashes 7%, 13%, 20%, right? Those are triggers that the, the market will literally stop automatically if, you know, if, um, if things are, are declining that fast or that. In, in that in that at, at that scale, um, and we don't really have circuit breakers in crypto uh, or in DeFi, um, and we need them. Uh, we desperately need them. But how you build those circuit breakers in, keeping in mind that like this is a global market now. It's twenty four seven, right? Like you can shut down one lending protocol like Compound, but like the rest of the but the every other protocol is still going to be working, and a bunch of other protocols are built on top of Compound, right? And rely on you know, C tokens. Um, and so how do you, how do you very like, uh, how do you very carefully introduce circuit breakers into protocols, knowing that like there's so much composability and so much integration, you know, with other systems, right? Like, are you going to break something else because you paused something? And then how do you, how do you deal with like someone taking advantage of that, like a, a bad actor taking advantage of that and basically continuing to shut down your system over and over and over again, like a DDoS attack, right? Could be right. a competitor, right? AMMs could, you know, try and shut each other down by, you know, sending malicious transactions, uh, you know, to each other all the time. So there's all those things you need to consider when you're building it. But um, I don't think that they, those should stop people from experimenting with more automated mechanisms for responding to threats. So I think, anyway, both those things will happen, you know, and we're already starting to see them happen. So that's exciting. 
That's great, man. I mean, that, those are really two cool things. You're going to, uh, just to recap that, you're going to see a lot of data scientists uh, start to come over to the Web3 security space and dominate. And then you're going to see some automated response happen instead of it having to be a manual multi-sig situation that's in place. And um, I'm sure it's going to take some time for those two things to happen. But as they do, uh, I think we're going to, the entire Web3 market's going to be better for it. So uh, Andy, you've given us a lot of gems. I think you did a really good job of just giving some really good basic knowledge of security and then what Ford is doing to help uh, solve some of those challenges. But uh, for everyone here, what is the final thought that you want to leave today? Um, my final thought, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with, you know, security, obviously, but, um, it's that, uh, um, anyone who's building, a anyone who's, who's, who's building smart contracts or, you know, works for, a works for a protocol team or some project in web three, um, uh, just keep in mind that, you know, security is a continuous thing, right? You, you don't just get an audit and then close the book on that. And assume you're safe, right? There, there are things you need to be doing constantly to protect your 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 infrastructure, your users. Um, Real time monitoring and alerting on Ford is just one you know piece of the piece of the puzzle, but it really is a, a continuous thing with a bunch of different parts, and you need to keep them all moving at the same time, you know, to to be um, to be effective. So that's a great final thought. Again, um, for everyone listening, ways that you can keep in touch, you can go to forda.org. Uh, but Andy, what are other ways that people can learn more about Forda and learn more about you? Yeah. Um, so uh, as Richard mentioned, our website's Forda.org. You can find some basic information there. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at Forda Network. Um, and you can also reach out to me directly if you want to get in touch and, and, and talk about you know, how you can use the, use the network. I'm at AJ Beal on Twitter and my DMs are open. Perfect. Well, Andy, again, thank you so much for spending time with us and for everyone listening, stay Cryptocurrent. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cryptocurrent. Cryptocurrent is a cryptocurrency and blockchain education platform that's bridging the gap between the curious newcomers who are just discovering the space and the thought leaders who are shaping its future. All opinions expressed by Richard Carthon, the Cryptocurrent team, and their guests on this show are exclusively their own opinions. This show and any other Cryptocurrent production is exclusively for informational purposes. 